Chapter Four of Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, Tweedle Dum and Tweedle Dee. They were standing under a tree, each with an arm around the other's neck, and Alice knew which was which in a moment because one of them had Dum embroidered on his collar and the other D. I suppose they've each got Tweedle round at the back of the collar, she said to herself they stood so still that she quite forgot they were alive and she was looking around to see if the word tweedle was written at the back of each collar when she was startled by a voice coming from the one marked dumb if you think we're waxworks he said you ought to pay you know waxworks aren't made to be looked at for nothing nohow contrawise added the one marked d if you think we're alive you are to speak i'm sure i'm very sorry was all alice could say for the words of the old song kept ringing through her head like the ticking of a clock and she could hardly help saying them out loud tweedledum and tweedledee agreed to have a battle for tweedledum said tweedledee had spoilt his nice new rattle just then flew down a monstrous crow as black as a tar barrel which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel i know what you're thinking about said tweedledum but it isn't so nohow contrawise continued tweedledee if it was so it might be and if it was so it would be but as it isn't it ain't that's logic i was thinking alice said very politely which is the best way out of this wood it's getting so dark would you tell me please but the little men only looked at each other and grinned they looked so exactly like a couple of great schoolboys that alice couldn't help pointing her finger at tweedledum and saying first boy no how tweedledum cried out briskly and shut his mouth up again with a snap next boy said alice passing on to tweedledee though she felt quite certain he would only shout out contrawise and so he did you've been wrong cried tweedledum the first thing in a visit is to say how do you do and shake hands and here the two brothers gave each other a hug and then they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with her alice did not like shaking hands with either of them first for fear of hurting the other one's feelings so as the best way out of the difficulty she took hold of both hands at once the next moment they were dancing round in a ring this seemed quite natural she remembered afterwards and she was not even surprised to hear music playing it seemed to come from the tree under which they were dancing and it was done as well as she could make it out by the branches rubbing one across the other like fiddles and fiddlesticks but it certainly was funny alice said afterwards when she was telling her sister the history of all this to find myself singing here we go round the mulberry bush i don't know when i began it but somehow i felt as if i'd been singing it for a long time the other two dancers were fat and very soon out of breath four times round is enough for one dance tweedledum panted out and they left off dancing as suddenly as they had begun the music stopped at the same moment then they let go of alice's hands and stood looking at her for a minute there was a rather awkward pause as alice didn't know how to begin a conversation with people she had just been dancing with it would never do to say how do you do now she said to herself we seem to have got beyond that somehow i hope you're not much tired she said at last no how and thank you very much for asking said tweedledum so much obliged added tweedledee you like poetry yes pretty well some poetry alice said doubtfully would you tell me which road leads out of the woods what shall i repeat to her 
said tweedledee looking round at tweedledum with great solemn eyes and not noticing alice's question the walrus in the carpenter is the longest tweedledum replied giving his brother an affectionate hug tweedledee began instantly the sun was shining here alice ventured to interrupt him if it's very long she said as politely as she could would you please tell me first which road tweedledee smiled gently and began again the sun was shining on the sea shining with all his might he did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright and this was odd because it was the middle of the night the moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done it's very rude of him she said to come and spoil the fun the sea was wet as wet could be the sands were dry as dry you could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky no birds were flying overhead there were no birds to fly the walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand they wept like anything to see such quantities of sand if this were only cleared away they said it would be grand if seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year do you suppose the walrus said that they could get it clear i doubt it said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear oh oysters come and walk with us the walrus did beseech a pleasant walk a pleasant talk along the briny beach we cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each the eldest oyster looked at him but never a word he said the eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed but four young oysters hurried up all eager for the treat their coats were brushed their faces washed their shoes were clean and neat and this was odd because you know they hadn't any feet four other oysters followed them and yet another four and thick and fast they came at last and more and more and more all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore the walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so and then they rested on a rock conveniently low and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row the time has come the walrus said to talk of many things of shoes and ships and sealing wax of cabbages and kings and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings but wait a bit the oysters cried before we have our chat for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat no hurry said the carpenter they thanked him much for that a loaf of bread the walrus said is what we chiefly need pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed now if you're ready oysters dear we can begin to feed but not on us the oysters cried turning a little blue after such kindness that would be a dismal thing to do the night is fine the walrus said do you admire the view it was so kind of you to come and you are very nice the carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice i wish you were not quite so deaf i've had to ask you twice it seems a shame the walrus said to play them such a trick after we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick the carpenter said nothing but the butter's spread too thick i weep for you the walrus said i deeply sympathize with sobs and tears he sorted out those of the larger size holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes oh oysters said the carpenter you've had a pleasant run shall we be trotting home again but answers came there none and that was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one i like the walrus best said alice because you see he was a little sorry for the poor oysters he ate more than the carpenter though said tweedledee you see he held his handkerchief in front so that carpenter couldn't count how many he took 
contrawise that was mean alice said indignantly then i like the carpenter best if he didn't eat so many as the walrus but he ate as many as he could get said tweedledum this was a puzzler after a pause alice began well they were both very unpleasant characters here she checked herself in some alarm at hearing something that sounded to her like the puffing of a large steam engine in the wood near them though she feared it was more likely to be a wild beast are there any lions or tigers about here she asked timidly yeah, it's only the red king snoring said tweedledee come and look at him the brothers cried and they each took one of alice's hands and led her up to where the king was sleeping isn't he a lovely sight said tweedledum alice couldn't say honestly that he was he had a tall red nightcap on with a tassel and he was lying crumpled up in a sort of untidy heap and snoring loud fit to snore his head off as tweedledum remarked i'm afraid he'll catch cold with lying on the damp grass said alice who was a very thoughtful little girl he's dreaming now said tweedledee and what do you think he's dreaming about alice said nobody can guess that why about you tweedledee exclaimed clapping his hands triumphantly and if he left off dreaming about you where do you suppose you'd be where i am now of course said alice not you tweedledee retorted contemptuously you'd be nowhere why you're only a sort of thing in his dream if that there king was to wake added tweedledum you'd go out bang just like a candle i shouldn't alice exclaimed indignantly besides if i'm only a sort of thing in his dream what are you i should like to know ditto said tweedledum ditto ditto cried tweedledee he shouted this so loud that alice couldn't help saying hush you'll be waking him i'm afraid if you make so much noise well it's no use your talking about waking him said tweedledum when you're only one of the things in his dream you know very well you're not real i am real said alice and began to cry you won't make yourself a bit realer by crying tweedledee remarked there's nothing to cry about if i wasn't real alice said half laughing through her tears it all seemed so ridiculous i shouldn't be able to cry i hope you don't suppose those are real tears tweedledum interrupted in a tone of great contempt i know they're talking nonsense alice thought to herself and it's foolish to cry about it so she brushed away her tears and went on as cheerfully as she could at any rate i'd better be getting out of the wood for really it's coming on very dark do you think it's going to rain tweedledum spread a large umbrella over himself and his brother and looked up into it no i don't think it is he said at least not under here no how but it may rain outside it may if it chooses said tweedledee we've no objection contrawise selfish things thought alice and she was going to say good-night and leave them when tweedledum sprang out from under the umbrella and seized her by the wrist do you see that he said in a voice choking with passion and his eyes grew large and yellow all in a moment as he pointed with a trembling finger at a small white thing lying under the tree it's only a rattle alice said after a careful examination of the little white thing not a rattlesnake you know she said hastily thinking that he was frightened only an old rattle quite old and broken i knew it was cried tweedledum beginning to stamp about wildly and tear his hair it's spoiled of course here he looked at tweedledee 
who immediately sat down on the ground and tried to hide himself under the umbrella alice laid her hand upon his arm and said in a soothing tone you needn't be so angry about an old rattle but it isn't old tweedledum cried in a greater fury than ever it's new i tell you i bought it yesterday my nice new rattle and his voice rose to a perfect scream all this time tweedledee was trying his best to fold up the umbrella with himself in it which was such an extraordinary thing to do that it quite took off alice's attention from the angry brother but he couldn't quite succeed and it ended in his rolling over bundled up in the umbrella with only his head out and there he lay opening and shutting his mouth and his large eyes looking more like a fish than anything else alice thought of course you agree to have a battle tweedledum said in a calmer tone i suppose so the other sulkily replied as he crawled out of the umbrella only she must help us to dress up you know so the two brothers went off hand in hand into the wood and returned in a minute with their arms full of things such as bolsters blankets hearthrugs tablecloths dish covers and coal scuttles i hope you're a good hand at pinning and tying strings tweedledum remarked every one of these things has to go on somehow or other alice said afterwards she had never seen such a fuss made about anything in all her life the way those two bustled about and the quantity of things they put on and the trouble they gave her in tying strings and fastening buttons really they'll be more like bundles of old clothes than anything else by the time they're ready she said to herself as she arranged a bolster round the neck of tweedledee to keep his head from being cut off as he said you know he added very gravely it's one of the more serious things that can possibly happen to one in battle to get one's head cut off alice laughed aloud but she managed to turn it into a cough for fear of hurting his feelings do i look very pale said tweedledum coming up to have his helmet tied on he called it a helmet though it certainly looked much more like a saucepan well yes a little alice replied gently i'm very brave generally he went on in a low voice only today i happen to have a headache uh, and i've got a toothache said tweedledee who had overheard the remark i'm far worse off than you then you'd better not fight today said alice thinking it a good opportunity to make peace we must have a bit of a fight but i don't care about going on long said tweedledum what's the time now tweedledee looked at his watch and said half past four let's fight till six and then have dinner said tweedledum very well the other said rather sadly and she can watch us only you better not come very close he added i generally hit everything i can see when i get really excited and i hit everything within reach cried tweedledum whether i can see it or not alice laughed you must hit the trees pretty often i should think she said tweedledum looked round him with a satisfied smile i don't suppose he said there'll be a tree left standing for ever so far round by the time we've finished and all about a rattle said alice still hoping to make them a little ashamed of fighting for such a trifle i shouldn't have minded it so much said tweedledum if it hadn't been a new one i wish the monstrous crow would come thought alice there's only one sword you know tweedledum said to his brother but you can have the umbrella it's quite as sharp only we must begin quick it's getting as dark as it can and darker eh? said tweedledee it was getting dark so suddenly that alice thought there must be a thunderstorm coming on what a thick black cloud that is she said and how fast it comes why i do believe it's got wings it's the crow 
Tweedledum cried out in a shrill voice of alarm, and the two brothers took to their heels and were out of sight in a moment. Alice ran a little way into the wood and stopped under a large tree. It can never get me here, she thought. It's far too large to squeeze itself in among the trees, but I wish it wouldn't flap its wings so. It makes quite a hurricane in the wood. Here's somebody's shawl being blown away. End of chapter four. Chapter five. Wool and water. She caught the shawl as she spoke and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the white queen came running wildly through the wood with both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying. And Alice very civilly went to meet her with the shawl. I'm very glad I happened to be in the way, Alice said, as she helped her to put on her shawl again. The White Queen only looked at her in a helpless, frightened sort of way and kept repeating something in a whisper to herself that sounded like bread and butter, bread and butter. And Alice felt that if there was to be any conversation at all, she must manage it herself. So she began rather timidly, Am I addressing the White Queen? Well, yes, if you call that addressing, the Queen said. It isn't my notion of the thing at all. Alice thought it would never do to have an argument at the very beginning of their conversation, so she smiled and said, If your Majesty will only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can. But I don't want it done at all, groaned the poor Queen. I've been addressing myself for the last two hours. It would have been all the better, as it seemed to Alice, if she had got someone else to dress her. She was so dreadfully untidy. Every single thing's crooked, Alice thought to herself, and she's all over pins. May I put your shawl straight for you? She added aloud. I don't know what's the matter with it the queen said in a melancholy voice it's out of temper i think i've pinned it here and i've pinned it there but there's no pleasing it it can't go straight you know if you pin it all on one side alice said as she gently put it right for her and dear me what a state your hair is in the brush has got entangled in it the queen said with a sigh and i lost the comb yesterday Alice carefully released the brush and did her best to get the hair into order. Come, you look rather better now, she said, after altering most of the pins. But really, you should have a lady's maid. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure, the Queen said. Tuppence a week and jam every day. Alice couldn't help laughing as she said, i don't want you to hire me and i don't care for jam it's very good jam the queen said well i don't want any today at any rate you couldn't have it if you did want it the queen said the rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday but never jam today it must come sometimes to jam today alice objected no it can't said the queen it's jam every other day today isn't any other day you know i don't understand you said alice it's dreadfully confusing that's the effect of living backwards the queen said kindly it always makes one a little giddy at first living backwards alice repeated in great astonishment i never heard of such a thing but there's one great advantage in it, that one's memory works both ways. I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the Queen remarked. What sort of things do you remember best? Alice ventured to say. Oh, things that happened the week after next, the Queen replied in a careless tone. For instance now she went on sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke 
there's the king's messenger he is in prison now being punished and the trial doesn't even begin till next wednesday and of course the crime comes last of all suppose he never commits the crime said alice that would be all the better wouldn't it the queen said as she bound the plaster round her finger with a bit of ribbon alice felt that there was no denying that of course it would be all the better she said but it wouldn't be all the better his being punished you're wrong there at any rate said the queen were you ever punished only for faults said alice and you were all the better for it i know the queen said triumphantly yes but then i had done the things i was punished for said alice that makes all the difference but if you hadn't done them the queen said that would have been better still better and better and better her voice went higher with each better till it got quite to a squeak at last alice was just beginning to say there's a mistake somewhere when the queen began screaming so loud that she had to leave the sentence unfinished oh 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 shouted the queen shaking her hand about as if she wanted to shake it off my fingers bleeding oh 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 her screams were so exactly like the whistle of a steam engine that alice had to hold both her hands over her ears what is the matter she said as soon as there was a chance of making herself heard have you pricked your finger i haven't pricked it yet the queen said but i soon shall oh 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 when do you expect to do it alice asked feeling very much inclined to laugh when i fasten my shawl again the poor queen groaned out the brooch will come undone directly oh oh as she said the words the brooch flew open and the queen clutched wildly at it and tried to clasp it again take care cried alice you're holding it all crooked and she caught at the brooch but it was too late the pin had slipped and the queen had pricked her finger that accounts for the bleeding you see she said to alice with a smile now you understand the way things happen here but why don't you scream now alice asked holding her hands ready to put over her ears again why i've done all the screaming already said the queen what would be the good of having it all over again by this time it was getting light the crow must have flown away i think said alice i'm so glad it's gone i thought it was the night coming on i wish i could manage to be glad the queen said only i never can remember the rule you must be very happy living in this wood and being glad whenever you like only it's so very lonely here alice said in a melancholy voice and at the thought of her loneliness two large tears came rolling down her cheeks oh don't go on like that cried the poor queen wringing her hands in despair consider what a great girl you are consider what a long way you've come to-day consider what o'clock it is consider anything only don't cry alice could not help laughing at this even in the midst of her tears can you keep from crying by considering things she asked that's the way it's done the queen said with great decision nobody can do two things at once you know let's consider your age to begin with how old are you i'm seven and a half exactly you needn't say exactly the queen remarked i can believe it without that now i'll give you something to believe i'm just one hundred and one five months and a day i can't believe that said alice can't you the queen said in a pitying tone try again draw a long breath and shut your eyes alice laughed there's no use trying she said one can't believe impossible things 
i dare say you haven't had much practice said the queen when i was your age i always did it for half an hour a day why sometimes i've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast there goes the shawl again the brooch had come undone as she spoke and a sudden gust of wind blew the queen's shawl across a little brook the queen spread out her arms again and went flying after it and this time she succeeded in catching it for herself i've got it she cried in a triumphant tone now you shall see me pin it on again all by myself then i hope your finger is better now alice said very politely as she crossed the little brook after the queen oh much better cried the queen her voice rising to a squeak as she went on much better 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 bear. the last word ended in a long bleat so like a sheep that alice quite started she looked at the queen who seemed to have suddenly wrapped herself up in wool alice rubbed her eyes and looked again she couldn't make out what had happened at all was she in a shop and was that really was it really a sheep that was sitting on the other side of the counter rub as she could she could make nothing more of it she was in a little dark shop leaning with her elbows on the counter and opposite to her was an old sheep sitting in an armchair knitting and every now and then leaving off to look at her through a great pair of spectacles what is it you want to buy the sheep said at last looking up for a moment from her knitting i don't quite know yet alice said very gently i should like to look all round me first if i might you may look in front of you and on both sides if you like said the sheep but you can't look all round you unless you've got eyes in the back of your head but these as it happened alice had not got so she contented herself with turning round looking at the shells as she came to them the shop seemed to be full of all manner of curious things but the oddest part of it all was that whenever she looked hard at any shelf to make out exactly what it had on it that particular shelf was always quite empty though the others around it were crowded as full as they could hold things flow about so here she said at last in a plaintive tone after she had spent a minute or so in vainly pursuing a large bright thing that looked sometimes like a doll and sometimes like a workbox and was always in the shelf next above the one she was looking at and this one is the most provoking of all but i'll tell you what she added as a sudden thought struck her i'll follow it up to the very top shelf of all it'll puzzle it to go through the ceiling i expect but even this plan failed the thing went through the ceiling as quietly as possible as if it were quite used to it are you a child or a teetotum the sheep said as she took up another pair of needles you'll make me giddy soon if you go on turning round like that she was now working with fourteen pairs at once and alice couldn't help looking at her in great astonishment how can she knit with so many the puzzled child thought to herself she gets more and more like a porcupine every minute can you row the sheep asked handing her a pair of knitting needles as she spoke yes a little but not on land and not with needles alice was beginning to say when suddenly the needles turned into oars in her hands and she found they were in a little boat gliding along between banks so there was nothing for it but to do her best thither cried the sheep as she took up another pair of needles this didn't sound like a remark that needed any answer so alice said nothing but pulled away there was something very queer about the water she thought as every now and then the oars got fast in it and would hardly come out again feather feather the sheep cried again taking more needles you'll be catching a crab directly a dear little crab thought alice 
i should like that didn't you hear me say feather the sheep cried angrily taking up quite a bunch of needles indeed i did said alice you've said it very often and very loud please where are the crabs in the water of course said the sheep sticking some of the needles into her hair as her hands were full feather i say why do you say feather so often alice asked at last rather vexed i'm not a bird you are said the sheep you're a little goose this offended alice a little so there was no more conversation for a minute or two while the boat glided gently on sometimes among the beds of weeds which made the oar stick fast in the water worse than ever and sometimes under trees but always with the same tall river banks frowning over their heads oh please there are some scented rushes alice cried in a sudden transport of delight they really are and such beauties you needn't say please to me about em the sheep said without looking up from her knitting i didn't put him there and i'm not going to take him away no but i meant please may we wait and pick some alice pleaded if you don't mind stopping the boat for a minute how am i to stop it said the sheep if you leave off rowing it'll stop of itself so the boat was left to drift down the stream as it would till it glided gently in among the waving rushes and then the little sleeves were carefully rolled up and the little arms were plunged in elbow deep to get the rushes a good long way down before breaking them off and for a while alice forgot all about the sheep and the knitting as she bent over the side of the boat with just the ends of her tangled hair dipping into the water while with bright eager eyes she caught at one bunch after another of the darling scented rushes i only hope the boat won't tipple over she said to herself oh what a lovely one only i couldn't quite reach it and it certainly did seem a little provoking almost as if it happened on purpose she thought that though she managed to pick plenty of beautiful rushes as the boat glided by there was always a more lovely one that she couldn't reach the prettiest are always further she said at last with a sigh at the obstinacy of the rushes in growing so far off as with flushed cheeks and dripping hair and hands she scrambled back into her place and began to arrange her new-found treasures what mattered it to her just then that the rushes had begun to fade and to lose all their scent and beauty from the very moment that she picked them even real scented rushes you know last only a very little while and these being dream rushes melted away almost like snow as they lay in heaps at her feet but alice hardly noticed this there were so many other curious things to think about they hadn't gone much farther before the blade of one of the oars got fast in the water and wouldn't come out again so alice explained it afterwards and the consequence was that the handle of it caught under her chin and in spite of a series of little shrieks of oh 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 from poor alice it swept her straight off the seat and down among the heap of rushes however she wasn't hurt and was soon up again the sheep went on with her knitting all the while just as if nothing had happened that was a nice crab you caught she remarked as alice got back into her place very much relieved to find herself still in the boat was it i didn't see it said alice peeping cautiously over the side of the boat into the dark water i wish it hadn't let go i should so like to see a little crab to take home with me but the sheep only laughed scornfully and went on with her knitting are there many crabs here said alice crabs and all sorts of things said the sheep plenty of choice only make up your mind 
now what do you want to buy to buy alice echoed in a tone that was half astonished and half frightened for the oars and the boat and the river had vanished all in a moment and she was back again in the little dark shop i should like to buy an egg please she said timidly how do you sell them five pence farthing for one two pence for two the sheep replied then two are cheaper than one alice said in a surprised tone taking out her purse only you must eat them both if you buy two said the sheep then i'll have one please said alice as she put her money down on the counter for she thought to herself they mightn't be at all nice you know the sheep took the money and put it away in a box then she said i never put things into people's hands that would never do you must get it for yourself and so saying she went off to the other end of the shop and set the egg upright on a shelf i wonder why it shouldn't do thought alice as she groped her way among the tables and chairs for the shop was very dark towards the end the egg seems to get further away the more i walk towards it let me see is this a chair why it's got branches i declare how very odd to find trees growing here and actually here's a little brook well this is the very queerest shop i ever saw so she went on wondering more and more at every step as everything turned into a tree the moment she came up to it and she quite expected the egg to do the same end of chapter five chapter six of humpty dumpty however the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human when she had come within a few yards of it she saw that it had eyes and a nose and mouth and when she had come close to it she saw that it was humpty dumpty himself it can't be anybody else she said to herself i'm as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face it might have been written a hundred times easily on that enormous face humpty dumpty was sitting with his legs crossed like a turk on the top of a high wall such a narrow one that alice quite wondered how he could keep his balance and as his eyes were steadily fixed in the opposite direction and he didn't take the least notice of her she thought he must be a stuffed figure after all and how exactly like an egg he is she said aloud standing with her hands ready to catch him for she was every moment expecting him to fall it's very provoking humpty dumpty said after a long silence looking away from alice as he spoke to be called an egg very i said you looked like an egg sir alice gently explained and some eggs are very pretty you know she added hoping to turn her remark into a sort of a compliment some people said humpty dumpty looking away from her as usual have no more sense than a baby alice didn't know what to say to this it wasn't at all like conversation she thought as he had never said anything to her in fact his last remark was evidently addressed to a tree so she stood and softly repeated to herself humpty dumpty sat on a wall humpty dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put humpty dumpty in his place again that last line is much too long for the poetry she added almost out loud forgetting that humpty dumpty would hear her don't stand there chattering to yourself like that humpty dumpty said looking at her for the first time well tell me your name and your business my name is alice but it's a stupid enough name humpty dumpty interrupted impatiently what does it mean must a name mean something alice asked doubtfully 
of course it must humpty dumpty said with a short laugh my name means the shape i am and a good handsome shape it is too with a name like yours you might be any shape almost why do you sit out here all alone said alice not wishing to begin an argument why because there's nobody with me cried humpty dumpty did you think i didn't know the answer to that ask another don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground alice went on not with any idea of making another riddle but simply in her good-natured anxiety for the queer creature that wall is so very narrow what tremendously easy riddles you ask humpty dumpty growled out of course i don't think so why if ever i did fall off which there's no chance of but if i did here he pursed his lips and looked so solemn and grand that alice could hardly help laughing if i did fall he went on the king has promised me with his very own mouth to 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 send all his horses and all his men alice interrupted uh, rather unwisely now i declare that's too bad humpty dumpty cried breaking into a sudden passion you've been listening at doors and behind trees and down chimneys or you couldn't have known it i haven't indeed alice said very gently it's in a book oh well they may write such things in a book humpty dumpty said in a calmer tone that's what you call a history of england that is now take a good look at me i'm one that has spoken to a king i am mayhap you'll never see such another and to show you i'm not proud you may shake hands with me and he grinned almost from ear to ear as he leant forwards and as nearly as possible fell off the wall in doing so and offered alice his hand she watched him a little anxiously as she took it if he smiled much more the ends of his mouth might meet behind she thought and then i don't know what would happen to his head i'm afraid it would come off yes all his horses and all his men humpty dumpty went on they pick me up again in a minute they would however this conversation is going on a little too fast let's go back to the last remark but one i'm afraid i can't quite remember it alice said very politely in that case we start fresh said humpty dumpty and it's my turn to choose a subject he talks about it just as if it was a game thought alice so here's a question for you how old did you say you were alice made a short calculation and said seven years and six months wrong humpty dumpty exclaimed triumphantly you never said a word like it i thought you meant how old are you alice explained if i'd meant that i'd have said it said humpty dumpty alice didn't want to begin another argument so she said nothing seven years in six months humpty dumpty repeated thoughtfully an uncomfortable sort of age now if you'd asked my advice i'd have said leave off at seven but it's too late now i never ask advice about growing alice said indignantly too proud the other inquired alice felt even more indignant at this suggestion i mean she said that one can't help growing older one can't perhaps said humpty dumpty but two can with proper assistance you might have left off at seven what a beautiful belt you've got on alice suddenly remarked they had had quite enough of the subject of age she thought and if they really were to take turns in choosing subjects it was her turn now 
at least she corrected herself on second thoughts a beautiful cravat i should have said no a belt i mean i beg your pardon she added in dismay for humpty dumpty looked thoroughly offended and she began to wish she hadn't chosen that subject if i only knew she thought to herself which was neck and which was waist evidently humpty dumpty was very angry though he said nothing for a minute or two when he did speak again it was in a deep growl it is a most provoking thing he said at last when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt i know it's very ignorant of me alice said in so humble a tone that humpty dumpty relented it's a cravat child and a beautiful one as you say it's a present from the white king and queen there now is it really said alice quite pleased to find that she had chosen a good subject after all they gave it me humpty dumpty continued thoughtfully as he crossed one knee over the other and clasped his hands round it they gave it me for an unbirthday present i beg your pardon alice said with a puzzled air i'm not offended said humpty dumpty i mean what is an unbirthday present a present given when it isn't your birthday of course alice considered a little i like birthday presents best she said at last you don't know what you're talking about cried humpty dumpty how many days are there in a year three hundred and sixty-five said alice and how many birthdays have you one and if you take one from three hundred and sixty-five what remains three hundred and sixty-four of course humpty dumpty looked doubtful i'd rather see that done on paper he said alice couldn't help smiling as she took out her memorandum book and worked the sum for him three hundred and sixty-five over one three hundred and sixty-four humpty dumpty took the book and looked at it carefully that seems to be done right he began you're holding it upside down alice interrupted to be sure i was humpty dumpty said gaily as she turned it round for him i thought it looked a little queer as i was saying that seems to be done right though i haven't time to look it over thoroughly just now and that shows that there are three hundred and sixty-four days when you might get unbirthday presents certainly said alice and only one for birthday presents you know there's glory for you i don't know what you mean by glory alice said humpty dumpty smiled contemptuously of course you don't till i tell you i meant there's a nice knock-down argument for you but glory doesn't mean a nice knock-down argument alice objected when i use a word humpty dumpty said in rather a scornful tone it means just what i choose it to mean neither more nor less the question is said alice whether you can make words mean so many different things the question is said humpty dumpty which is to be master that's all alice was too much puzzled to say anything so after a minute humpty dumpty began again they've a temper some of them particularly verbs they're the proudest adjectives you can do anything with but not verbs however i can manage the whole lot of them impenetrability that's what i say would you tell me please said alice what that means now you talk like a reasonable child said humpty dumpty looking very much pleased i meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject and it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next as i suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life that's a great deal to make one word mean alice said in a thoughtful tone 
when i make a word to a lot of work like that said humpty dumpty i always pay it extra oh said alice she was too much puzzled to make any other remark oh you should see em come round me of a saturday night humpty dumpty went on wagging his head gravely from side to side for to get their wages you know alice didn't venture to ask what he paid them with and so you see i, I can't tell you you seem very clever at explaining words sir said alice would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem called jabberwocky let's hear it said humpty dumpty i can explain all the poems that were ever invented and a good many that haven't been invented just yet this sounded very hopeful so alice repeated the first verse twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe all mimsy were the borogroves and the mome wraths outgrabe that's enough to begin with humpty dumpty interrupted there are plenty of hard words there brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon the time when you begin broiling things for dinner that'll do very well said alice and slithy well slithy means lithe and slimy lithe is the same as active you see it's like a portmanteau there are two meanings packed up into one word i see it now alice remarked thoughtfully and what are toves well toves are something like badgers there's something like lizards and there's something like corkscrews they must be very curious looking creatures they are that said humpty dumpty also they make their nests under sundials also they live on cheese and what's the gyre and to gimble to gyre is to go round and round like a gyroscope to gimble is to make holes like a gimlet and the, the wave is the grass plot round a sundial i suppose said alice surprised at her own ingenuity of course it is it's called wave you know because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it and a long way beyond it on each side alice added exactly so well then mimsy is flimsy and miserable that's another portmanteau for you and a borogrove is a thin shabby looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round something like a live mop and then momraths said alice i'm afraid i'm giving you a great deal of trouble well a wrath is a sort of green pig but mom i'm not certain about i think it's short for from home meaning that they'd lost their way you know and what does outgrabe mean well outgrabing is something between bellowing and whistling with a kind of sneeze in the middle however you'll hear it done maybe down in the wood yonder and when you've once heard it you'll be quite content who's been repeating all that hard stuff to you i read it in a book said alice but i had some poetry repeated to me much easier than that by tweedledee i think it was oh it needn't come to that alice hastily said hoping to keep him from beginning the piece i'm going to repeat he went on without noticing her remark was written entirely for your amusement alice felt that in that case she really ought to listen to it so she sat down and said thank you rather sadly in winter when the fields are white i sing this song for your delight only i don't sing it he added as an explanation i, I see you don't said alice if you can see whether i'm singing or not you've sharper eyes than most humpty dumpty remarked severely alice was silent in spring when woods are getting green i'll try and tell you what i mean thank you very much said alice in summer 
when the days are long perhaps you'll understand the song in autumn when the leaves are brown take pen and ink and write it down i will if i can remember it so long said alice you needn't go making remarks like that humpty dumpty said they're not sensible and they put me out i sent a message to the fish i told them this is what i wish the little fishes of the sea they sent an answer back to me the little fish's answer was we cannot do it sir because i'm afraid i don't quite understand said alice it gets easier further on humpty dumpty replied i said to them again to say it will be better to obey the fishes answered with a grin why what a temper you are in i told them once i told them twice they would not listen to advice i took a kettle large and new fit for the deed i had to do my heart went hop my heart went thump i filled the kettle at the pump then someone came to me and said the little fishes are in bed i said to him i said it plain then you must wake them up again i said it very loud and clear i went and shouted in his ear humpty dumpty raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated this verse and alice thought with a shudder i wouldn't have been the messenger for anything but he was very stiff and proud he said you needn't shout so loud and he was very proud and stiff he said i'd go and wake them if i took a corkscrew from the shelf i went to wake them up myself and when i found the door was locked i pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked and when i found the door was shut i tried to turn the handle but there was a long pause is that all alice timidly asked that's all said humpty dumpty good-bye this was rather sudden alice thought but after such a very strong hint that she ought to be going she felt that it would hardly be civil to stay so she got up and held out her hand good-bye till we meet again she said as cheerfully as she could i shouldn't know you again if we did meet humpty dumpty replied in a discontented tone giving her one of his fingers to shake you're so exactly like other people the face is what one goes by generally alice remarked in a thoughtful tone that's just what i complain of said humpty dumpty your face is the same as everybody has the two eyes so marking their places in the air with his thumb nose in the middle mouth under it's always the same now if you had the two eyes on the same side of the nose for instance or the mouth at the top that would be some help it wouldn't look nice alice objected but humpty dumpty only shut his eyes and said wait till you've tried alice waited a minute to see if he would speak again but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her she said good-bye once more and getting no answer to this she quietly walked away but she couldn't help saying to herself as she went of all the unsatisfactory she repeated this aloud as it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say of all the unsatisfactory people i've ever met she never finished the sentence for at this moment a heavy crash shook the forest from end to end end of chapter six